Mm. I'm going to start the recording. I see Connie from Davis has joined us. <clears throat> so I want to welcome all of you uh, for a meeting of the uh, ALS directors. And the other people who are included are lots of people from USBE, uh, as well as all the um, representatives from the resettlement agencies. Um, because as you all know, uh, Title III is really focuses on students learning English, which includes uh, refugees, immigrants, um, oftentimes unaccompanied minors, asylees. <clears throat> so the work that we do with the resettlement agencies is really critical, uh, especially considering issues related to enrollment of Ukrainian and um, Afghan uh, refugees. Um, and if you don't know, Ukrainian families are, are sponsored. Right, so they have sponsors because uh, when they were evacuated during the war, <clears throat> usually if they had fathers, the fathers stayed there to fight. So the work with Ukrainian refugees, I think, is really, <clears throat> really important for us to understand that background. Uh, and again, I'll extend the invitation to, after this meeting, if you want to stay and ask me other questions or in the middle of anything. So it's best that you just, um, you know, unmute and ask your question in the middle of whatever we're doing, because you're welcome to do that, instead of putting questions in the chat. Um, because I like to be present to everybody instead of monitoring the chat as well. Uh, so let me outline what we're actually going to do. <clears throat> so Carl and I have had this really interesting back and forth related to the history of dual language immersion um, and the impact it's had on uh, students who want to learn another language, right? So uh, we've worked really consistently, and especially this last year, in trying to expand the awareness of the assets that we already have in the state. You know, uh, I do a humanities course on Fridays um, in person, and the students that I'm there with and learn with are from uh, Burundi and Eritrea and Guatemala and many of them, and Somali, many of them know two or three languages. So Utah has really been, you know, on the forefront of welcoming refugees. So the first part of our meeting is going to be um, collaboration between uh, ALS understanding the needs of multilingual learners <clears throat> and then the advantage, especially with um, the wonderful indigenous languages that we have in Utah, uh, with Carl, who oversees the biliteracy seal. And he'll introduce himself and give a little background as well. I think that piece is important. Uh, so Carl will be here with us and he'll be able to respond to any questions that you have, <clears throat> as well as um, thinking about expanding the ability for, you know, all the students in Utah uh, to be able to have the Utah Biliteracy Seal. So we'll do that first, and then we have um, Susie Estrada, and she's no relative, but she's very sweet, so, you know, uh, and very enthusiastic about her new position, and so she'll give you a background, and it's really important that you feel free to ask questions of me or Carl you know, or Susie. And then um, a little bit later, we're going to have Anne Michelle Neal talk about the Utah Consolidated Plan that was actually submitted in December. We've been trying to get some, um, you know, information from the Department of Education uh, because people are, um, in some ways, there's a lot of anxiety around weeded testing as well as uh, what does a reclassification score really mean for instruction, right? So, so we'll do that too. Uh, and then we'll have kind of an open forum. And remember, you can ask questions in between 
um, so that and it's being recorded, and then it'll be uploaded, uh, you know, onto our Title III Supporting Students Learning English playlist at um, USBE. So you'll have access to that. Um, do you have any any questions before we start? Now that you have a sense of the agenda. Okay, so um, I'll say one other thing before Carl kind of steps up. And <clears throat> in the email I sent out, I actually sent the updated, just so you know, Carl, uh, I sent the updated, uh, expanded way in which the Utah Biliteracy seal can be used, especially focusing on uh, the intermediate level of English. So, you know, the way in which we can expand it more. <clears throat> Um, and the other thing is, and I don't exactly know why this happened, but <clears throat> when we started thinking about um, the reclassification score and then all the implications, for some strange reason I, I blocked it out that there was no reason to connect exit WIDA scores with uh, biliteracy seal. I mean, I don't know why I was so clueless. Uh, but Carl helped me see the wisdom of that, and so I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Okay, Carl. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be here and uh, so very grateful to be collaborating with uh, Dr. Estrada um, in, in the CELA by Literacy and in Dual Language Immersion. We are grateful for her expertise and, and professionalism. Um, just let me share my screen, if you don't mind. Can I do that? Um, I'm just showing the um, this, the uh, evidence of proficiency uh, for the seal of biliteracy and looking looking through uh, these evidences. And if if you'll notice, most of the uh, all of the things we're looking for are in the intermediate range. And as I go through these pieces and come down to the English proficiency portion. Going to be looking at the WIDA World Class Instructional Design Assessment Efficiency Assessment for ELs. We've we've settled on the 4.2 composite score because it is the measure of the intermediate English proficiency for that assessment, and, and it is not related to the exit score of 5.0, which is the which is the federal guideline. Uh, this is a state award, and we don't have to link those two. Uh, because we are wanting to measure the English proficiency of the student. And so we're, 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 we have settled on the 4.2 composite score for WIDA for this purpose of the seal of biliteracy. Um, and uh, the other piece that I wanted to, are there any questions about that before I move on to the next piece that I wanted to point out for the seal of biliteracy? Awesome. Uh, the next piece that I wanted to point out is uh, right up here. Uh, one of the one of the options for seal of biliteracy is the use of portfolios, because as you know, there are many uh, assessments that don't uh, provide um, acknowledgement of, of the many languages that are that are need to be assessed in the state of Utah for students who speak those languages. Excuse me. So we we provide the portfolio option for those students who need who need to be assessed in 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 the language other than English to be able to to find uh, what their levels are so that we can we can offer the seal of biliteracy. They can demonstrate the proficiency in English, but we also need a way to provide the uh, demonstration of proficiency in, in the language that they speak. Whether it be if there's a second language, third language, or fourth language, we, we need to provide that. So what we do is we offer the portfolio, um, where this is not the where the assessment is not listed above, and and this portfolio consists of an oral proficiency interview. Now, if there is an OPI that is available, that that's great, or a WPT, which is a writing assessment, that's wonderful, and those they're offered in eighty plus languages. But uh, we find that there are many languages that are not offered. So what we've done is we've made an arrangement with Dr. Fernando Rubio at the University of Utah, where the LEA can contact me 
with a student, whether we find a student that speaks a language that's not included in these in these that are offered here uh, for these proficiency guidelines. And we find then for them a community member who's, who's an adult in their community who speaks that language. And then we, we, we find a willing adult who is being, who's willing to be trained in the proficiency guidelines so that they can then become the evaluator and be able to provide an OPI and a written proficiency test for that student and be able to provide these two assessments for that student and then provide a rating for their proficiency and then award the CEDA. So if you have questions about a language, please contact me directly so that I can help you through that process and uh, train those community members to offer the seal of biliteracy for those students. This portfolio option um, is really important for any students who, who, who you would like to offer that seal. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way to remove barriers and help students receive, receive those awards. So um, any questions about the portfolio option for your students? Wonderful. Um, any questions about the seal in, in any other regard? Excellent. Back to you, Estelle. I'm mean, Chris Estelle. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Carl. Um, so the other thing I think that's important is, you know, looking at a family language as an asset. Uh, whenever I do focus groups with families, <clears throat> they oftentimes have no idea about the biliteracy seal. And it's nobody's fault, but the question is, how can we heighten the awareness of administrators, uh, counselors, um, and I think in one school, which is really interesting, they even have a really cool graphic that talks about the biliteracy seal. So when anybody goes into the counseling office, they actually see the opportunity. But again, you know, this goes back to the idea that <clears throat> if we really value uh, engaging families uh, in a way that they have the kind of access that native English speaking families do, uh, then we have to figure out how to really reach out to them. You know, one, again, one of the things when I have uh, focus groups for parents, you know, that is one of the things they say. They say, well, we don't, yes, we really want our students to learn English, but we also want them to maintain their family language, their heritage language. And so, um, you know, how, how, how do we do that? I mean, how, do, how does that happen? So I really would encourage um, everybody on, on this meeting and also in every LEA to really reach out. Uh, you know, the new legislation last year was uh, language services for parents, uh, besides being a civil right, is now state law. I mean, there's really, there's no excuse for not engaging families in the way in which helps them be more knowledgeable about being involved in their uh, child's education. And I think I said this last time, but one of the perfect examples, uh, and I, I don't know if Stephanie is on this from uh, Tooele, <clears throat> but you know, they're really working hard to, um, to ensure that the Goshut language uh, survives, right? And so Goshut is, you know, another <clears throat> kind of derivative of, of another tribal language and we have that um, tri we have tribal families from there, and so respecting that language is really important. And again, when I was down on the Nav Navajo reservation, um, you know, I visited this most wonderful uh, Navajo class, and <clears throat> I now have copies of their textbooks in Navajo uh, that are fabulous because there's even like a pathway from Navajo one to uh, you know, Navajo 4, and they just got, uh, you know, a $2.5 million uh, grant uh, to maintain the Navajo language. And when I interviewed the students from classes, this one wonderful student said, <clears throat> when I asked him, what are you learning today? Why are you learning it? You know, and how will you know that you've been successful? 
he talked about his experience of uh, speaking Navajo with his grandparents uh, on the res. Um, and especially during the winter months when uh, there was a youth group that was going out to provide wood um, to, you know, families that were living uh, on the reservation didn't have heating. So all these things are really valuable and important. And the fact that uh, Utah is noted for its welcoming environment for refugees and its commitment to kind of the global economy based on the advantage of having 165 languages. You know, I have friends who um, have no idea that Utah is so diverse. So, you know, we have this incredible advantage. So I would really, really encourage you to work closely with Carl, uh, as well as making sure that your families, in their language, uh, understand the opportunities for their uh, children to be awarded the biliteracy seal. Okay, so what, what other questions do you have or comments, questions or comments? Okay, so um, Susie, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, I'm sure there, there will be questions, um, and I'll ask questions too. Thank you, Dr. Estrada. So my name is uh, Susie Estrada, and I'm a new family and community engagement specialist with uh, the Utah State Board of Education. Um, I'm really appreciating how often the importance of family engagement is coming up in this conversation, in this presentation. Uh, I'm recognizing a few names from the participant uh, list. Some quick background on me. I am originally from North Hollywood, California. So I moved to Utah in 2014. Um, and my first job in Utah was actually helping uh, Provo School District with their ELL students. So I helped with the WIDA assessment um, and was a paraprofessional on the ground providing one-on-one -on -one uh, tutoring uh, and mentoring for our ELL students, specifically at Centennial Middle School, um, but then eventually throughout the district. Uh, so as we're talking about family and community engagement, we're really talking about systems of support. Um, oftentimes I found that these students didn't just need tutoring or help translating uh, their homework from English to Spanish. Uh, what the families needed was connection and networks and knowing that there was someone that they could trust and advocate for them at the school um, and someone that under understood them or at least wanted to, right? Uh, I had students that, for example, were coming to Utah and say them status from Brazil. Um, and so I don't know what that feels like, but uh, building that connection with their, with their family as far as, I, I don't know what this is like, but help me understand. And what else do you need in addition to just that academic support was so important. Um, working with other departments within the district. So if we had a student that was a youth in custody uh, student, for example, being able to communicate about, this is what we're seeing as far as our language, this is how it's showing up in academics with how that's also influencing behavior and the conversations that they're having um, or the activities that they're engaging with. Um, all of those things really play a bigger part into if we're thinking about Brom and Burner and then social, you know, the hierarchy of needs, um, that feeling of belonging, and then looking at, um, sorry, that was massive, Brom and Burner, thinking about all the systems, micro to macro, all of those things that really play into the way that our students are developing, um, viewing themselves as people, as students, and then as members of our community uh, are so important. So please reach out to me. Uh, I'm really looking forward to working with you all uh, as we develop some ways to really start building those connections with our families. Um, I've been here, my first day was December 5th, so I haven't been here too long. Um, and I, one of the things that I think I keep hearing is establishing a culture of trust throughout all of our schools. So instead of just going from Provo School District, I know I have one person there that I can call and ask any question and they'll answer that, knowing that if they leave and then move to Salt Lake, 
uh, and they're in Granite School District, for example, that they can trust the system throughout the whole state rather than just one person is something I keep hearing. Um, and I'm assuming we're all here because we love our kids and we want to see stronger communities. So please, again, reach out. Uh, I really want to hear your thoughts on what you're seeing at your schools, um, what you've heard from families, all of the things, and really use your, your insight and your expertise as we start to really develop some of these programs, some of these trainings. Um, you all might receive a survey here soon. We are looking at a training in June around uh, family and community engagement uh, with our partner, uh, Flamboyan. Um, and so just gathering some dates on when when you all would be interested in, in participating in that, um, networking events, some trainer trainer programs. Um, and then also I would just like to visit your schools and get to know you all uh, as well. So I'll put my email in the chat um, and you all can reach out to me. Thanks, Susie. Uh, I'm gonna wait for some questions. One question I keep getting <clears throat> is about funding for um, home visits. And I knew that had been a part of, I think, Cheryl's, the work that Cheryl had done. So uh, do you know, and Carl just put his uh, information in the chat as well, and so did Susie. Uh, so can you tell us uh, anything about that, about um, home visits and anything that is a carryover from the previous funding and how that's done? Uh, so we just had our last application uh, cycle that ended in October, November. Um, at that time, there was a transition period between the previous specialist and myself. Uh, so there was a slight delay. Some of you just got your intentional award letters uh, and I'm so sorry about that delay. Um, we currently don't have an application cycle right now, but we are exploring further funding uh, the funding for those home visits came through ESSER funds, which um, COVID is, is over. Um, and so the, we're looking for different options because it is an important part and a, an important tool to be able to uh, build those connections with families. Uh, so we'll make an announcement as soon as we have more to share about that. Um, but if you are interested in looking at other ways to connect with families, I am a strong believer that people should be uh, especially in this financial time uh, that is so hard for all of us. Uh, people should be paid for their time that they're they're working uh, 100%. But if you're looking for other ways in which you can do that um, with other ways, one of the things that we're really pushing for is embedding family and community engagement, not just as one section or one position at your school, but in all of the different things. So if you're looking at planning an event, or community partnerships, um, again, reach out to me and we can talk about that and some other ways in which you can do that where you're not um, having to request people to do things on their own time without pay. Um, and then we will send out some more announcements as soon as we have some more ideas on how we can continue to fund those home visits. Thanks again, Susie, I really appreciate that. So do you have any other questions for Susie? Okay, thanks so much, Susie. Krista? Yes. Can I just say thank you? I, um, I'm definitely gonna reach out to Carl and Susie because I, we know that there's much needed work to be done here and, um, and I can definitely benefit from both of their assistance. So thank you for having them. Thanks. For those of you who don't know, that was uh, Veronica from uh, Nebo. Okay, so uh, the next thing we're gonna do because we're waiting uh, to have this next conversation. <clears throat> I've been meeting with a range of people to talk about um, the redesign of, and I sent this out to people, the redesign of the Title III website. Uh, we're in the process of redesigning it so that it's more accessible. I'll give you a concrete example. <clears throat> uh, on the Title III website, there is um, a handbook about spending. Now, the advantage is, uh, from my six years being here, uh, the way in which Title III funds have been spent um, is always, you know, uh, really valuable. So, and many, many times it's just a designation in relationship to paraprofessionals. So that's, 
uh, and I, the reason I'm saying that is there were some charter schools that had no idea they could actually use Title III funds for uh, extra support. Uh, and there's been some communication from some agencies that aren't clear and think that Title III funds are so restrictive. Okay, so the only thing you have to know about Title III funds <clears throat> is that it supports uh, the students uh, in acquiring English. And so there's a wide range. And so on the Title III website, the Allowable Expenditures Handbook is there. So whenever you are in, you worry or you're in, you're in doubt, then you just go there and it gives you some really interesting case studies. Another thing is, based on funding, many people don't really know, and I understand this, um, is that uh, Title III funds, if you're a school uh, and you're in a district or you're the LEA in a, a charter, and the number of students that you have learning English is not the apportionment that moves you above the 10,000 mark, then you can join a consortium. So an example is a lot of the rural districts uh, join a consortium uh, and they have one fiscal agent. And that fiscal agent, it can't be USBE, it has to be somebody in the consortium that um, assumes the responsibility of fiscal agent. So it's the same thing with charter schools. We have, um, I think, three charters, uh, charter consortiums. And so there's one charter that ends up being the fiscal manager for a group of charters so that their allocation, their total allocation is over $10,000. And the reason that happens is that when we get the funding, which is usually about five and a half million, which when you think about it, divided across all the LEAs and all the charters, uh, is not that much. The per pupil allocation uh, ends up being, uh, you know, below the 10,000 uh, kind of minimum. So all that information is on the Title III website. Uh, and I'm focusing on these based on, you know, the way in which I get questions. The other thing that's on the Title III website is um, all the online professional learning in a course uh, catalog that's called um, Communities of Practice. So there are two new courses on there. One course, and previously all the uh, ESL courses run by USBE uh, during COVID were there. But now, since we're transi uh, transitioning to competency-based, you just have to email me so that you can have access to all those courses. So if your LEA has a Canvas system just email me and tell me you want to be a teacher and a designer in all those courses so that you can start designing the kind of professional learning that's suitable for uh, your LEA. Okay, so that's another piece that's on there. It's the Communities of Practice um, catalog. So it says professional learning and then you go and it says it has a course catalog. Okay, and then the courses that have been retired uh, are for the ESL endorsement, but I still have access can, that can make you a teacher. So you would have access to all the resources to design your own uh, competency-based and university-based, um, you know, ESL endorsement. Okay, so that's another resource. Another resource is um, the translation uh, of all the countries in the world in their educational system so that counselors can actually provide credit for students who come to us with a transcript uh, that's um, other than the uh, system of our system. And so those translation services for uh, giving students credit is really important. The underlying assumption is that, you know, I've met lots and I've worked with lots and lots of students who come from other countries. So to provide support for counselors and for LEAs to help them better understand the placement for students at the secondary level is really important. You know, I met a student um, 
who actually, when I actually got her transcript, she had taken physics and chemistry and um, calculus and advanced mathematics. And it was obvious that her interest was science. But then when she was programmed, not, nothing really benefited her as far as her interests. So you see what I'm saying? I mean, so those resources on the Title uh, three website are really important. Uh, we don't do things like when people email me and say, you know, uh, what what is the curriculum and what is the uh, recommended uh, textbook for newcomers? Okay, so we don't do recommendations. What we what I do is I introduce them to teachers and districts who are doing amazing work with newcomers because you know basically the way in which you're learning a new language because it's language acquisition is not based on a textbook or curriculum it's actually based on relationships uh, that are developed so that you better understand the needs of the learner as well as the family right so the website is not designed to do that on the other hand when I meet with people and I'm going to ask them maybe if they would pop in and say something they have these amazing resources um, as approaches that they use in their district, not models of the one silver bullet that fits everybody, right? Because that, that doesn't really make sense. <clears throat> so my thinking is that we would actually have on the website all these um, opportunities and options so that people could see what other districts are doing in relationship to either newcomers the newcomer program, the competency-based ESL endorsement, um, you know, the way in which uh, frequently asked questions help people better understand the rights of parents. That's one thing on there. The civil rights obligations, the state legislation, so that it would be like a one one-stop resource for people to actually uh, then connect. So, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, Instead of me connecting you with all these amazing teachers like all over the state, you'd actually have a resource for that. So what other comments do you have related to that? And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to ask if it's okay with Thais to talk about some of the resources. Uh, and this is an ongoing, the ongoing issue is the way in which students are programmed. There's some really strange ideas about um, and then parents are never included in, you know, pro programming students. So I can give you, I'm not going to give you all these examples that I already have of complaints from families about the way their students are programmed or from the students who are programmed uh, not very effectively and not listened to about their interests. So, um, I don't know, Thais, do you want to talk a little bit about, we're talking about professional learning and training for registrars and secretaries. So you want me to talk about our newcomer program in relationship to registration? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and you can, you can do pretty much uh, other things that we've talked about in smaller groups related to, you know, how you work with registrars and counselors and programming. It could be, you can also add the whole I, I keep on getting this newcomer thing about, you know, like the silver yeah. bullet for newcomers. And there's no silver bullet for newcomers. You know, not only is there no silver bullet, but one of the things I find myself saying a lot is that when we're trying to make decisions for newcomers, the needs for them are so um, great and so diverse that it's almost always impossible to say we're going to meet all of those perfectly. And I have to tell people that call me with concerns all the time when they're like, but I feel like I'm failing them because I have this and this and I can't do everything. And I have to, I have to often just say, you know, like you said, there isn't a silver bullet. We have to look at the resources we have. We have to look at needs and, and we're never choosing between a good option and a poor option. We're always choosing between all important options and that's a really hard balance and and we have to give ourselves a little grace in that um, and be reflective and use our resources but um, but also understand that you know it's never going to be as perfect as we'd like it to be um, uh, I think there's some really great things out there though and I think we can learn a lot from each other um, in terms of our structure I, I find it helps to give a little context 
um, when people are asking about newcomer programs. So just a little context, we have about 100 newcomers. Um, we define newcomers um, in terms of who qualifies for the program that we offer. So that's third through 12th grade in our district. So 100 third through 12th graders. So that would not count um, siblings that are K through two in those numbers, which we have, and we do track those as well. And I don't have those off the top of my head. And then we also, our program is optional. So when Christelle talks about parent involvement, um, when we talk about registration for a newcomer program, um, we are very clear that it is an optional resource um, and it's not always desired by everyone. And, um, and we honor that and structure that. So when a family, basically what happens is um, in our district, we go in and we train all of our administrative assistants, secretaries across the district on how to um, watch for uh, identifying factors of potential newcomer families. Um, it's easier when we have official refugees because the state contacts us, right? So, so that's always, uh, they contact the district directly. So we, I don't worry about those so much with, we have a different set of training we do in terms of how to support them, but not necessarily how to find and identify them. Um, and then we have a district team um, that consists of um, two liaisons um, and they have a whole protocol. We use like a Google survey. So when the, our administrative assistants have someone who registers. They, if they find someone that they feel is a newcomer, they flag them and they do an immediate referral to our district team. Our district team then reaches out to that family um, and talks to them about the options that we have. We have a newcomer program as well as if they are Spanish speaking family, we have a DLI program. So we, we present those options to them and we ask them their wishes. We tell them the pros and the cons because there are pros and cons. Um, and we find out what the family would like to do. Um, from there, if the family would like to be part of the program, then um, our district liaisons work with the site to help them complete the registration and transportation and all of those things. Um, we don't have, um, we have one busing, we have like, well, actually we got two this year, we're super excited. <laughs> but um, we have basically two buses that go through the entire district pick up the families and then drop them off at, we have one elementary, one junior high, one high school. And um, within that program, um, so basically that's our registration. And then we really try to support the schools. So we kind of have some support with that translation with secondary for transcripts, um, maybe setting up an additional meeting with the counselor and our liaison and um, the family so that we can discuss what they've experienced and what they've done. So we do that as well at the secondary level. Um, one of the things that we have challenges with that comes up with some of the things Christelle and, and others across the state we've talked about is um, this new HB 230 um, that's come out and kind of examining the relationship between that. And while that is a little bit about what do you do when there's, um, no birth certificate, we often find we have a birth certificate, but we have inconsistent academic information. So then there's also that piece about counselors and parents. And so we've really been processing that as a district in HB 230. So we've always kind of had a protocol of what happens when we get these students that haven't been to school. So I have a case right now, for example, um, family from Honduras, compulsory education is only in sixth grade, and I use the state document to help with that. That's a fabulous document. We use it all the time um, as a reference. We love that document. Um, and then we put together a quick committee. Um, we're trying to, to beef up the, what would you say, the official protocols that go with that. We kind of unofficial at this time, but we've always sought that parent input. So we're kind of seeking out the parent input, um, finding out why a student hasn't been in school, um, what are their goals? What do they want to accomplish? Um, what's important to them? What is um, their literacy skills? We kind of try to do all that. And then we are trying to just make the best call about what's the appropriate placement for grade. And we only do that when we're trying to train our secretaries how to notice when there's a discrepancy between United States protocols and standards and what they're receiving. Um, and just kind of more of like their job is to flag them and then notify like our district team and their admin. And then we kind of all work together to get information from the families and then make a decision from there. And probably the only other thing that uh, Christelle said that I would mention is that once they're in our newcomer program, um, 
we are very committed to making sure they're getting um, their core content with their peers. It is not a truly isolated program. So at our secondary level, it's just an MLL class and they have to give up like an extra elective. Um, and we have a very set protocol, which we train our counselors on. It's a set continuum that has a very set structure of how to get out with the vertical alignment between our schools. So we have a very clear goal of what our program is supposed to accomplish and how we track that data and how we quickly try to get them even more mainstreamed, but we make sure that they don't miss any of their core content. Um, and at our elementary level, they do a half day in their grade level, and then they do a half day learning literacy skills. Um, but we make sure that core content is all of the math, science, and uh, English language arts kinds of things that they're supposed to be getting. So they're, the whole school structures their day to support that. So what else do you want me to mention? No, I think that's a great tie because it brings up some really interesting things uh, in relationship to the question that shapes the Title III visit. And that was provided by the Department of Education and their peer review. And they said, how is the state agency going to ensure that students learning English have access to grade level content? That is the only question we should be focusing on. We shouldn't be focusing on this is too hard for them and they don't know English and we're going to put them in all these low level classes that is not that are not aligned to core content or academic language. OK, so that's like a big no, no. Uh, not only from the feds, but from the question that they asked the state board about ensuring that every student learning English has access to grade level content. So you have to think differently about what you what you're actually providing. Uh, now, I don't want to put uh, I might put Dave Gomez. I hope he's here. His name is here. Yeah, they, I'm here. OK, Dave, because they did some because the issue that comes up is about placing students in in and segregating them. This is like a huge civil rights violation in relationship to, you know, they're all in low level classes and not necessarily talking about tracking, but it ends up, you know, equating to that. And I think uh, Dave and Granite have done some really interesting work in looking at the data of students who have been uh, programmed in all kinds of different ways and the impact that that makes. So Dave, do you want to talk about the data? That. Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but we our um, testing department looked at students who were enrolled in our secondary ESL and ELD class. Some of you have heard this before, like Monty, I shared this at our other meeting we were in, but um, we looked at kids who were in our ESL and ELD classes in our secondary. Then we looked at kids who weren't in any of those classes. We then looked at kids that were maybe in one of them, and probably no surprise to all of you here today, uh, you know, the, the kids that succeeded the most based on state testing and then other tests that we had in our district, the ones that did the best were the ones that didn't have any of those classes, were not enrolled in an ESL or an ELD class. So then that made us look and go, gee, we need to start asking some more questions, right? It's not that those classes can't be effective and that they shouldn't be effective. It's what what is going on with this dynamic that Granite's got to look at and look at the pieces of those ELD classes and ESL courses that we've got to improve on. And so we started looking at the standards for those and we've redone those standards and um, we took a little different approach to what Thais is doing. Granite has always had a um, kind of a newcomer, really a refugee program called Tumaini, but we've gotten so large when you get thousands of newcomers um, into your district, a program like, like what Thais um, is talking about doesn't necessarily work for us anymore. And so now we've had to look at really actually creating um, schools within a school, right? Not a new concept. I've been doing this for what, Christelle, 30 years or maybe more. And so now we're looking at schools having similar to what Thais talked about, but in a different look of having newcomer classes within our schools, right? And, and now we're writing standards for those as well. And so 
we kind of had to take those and bridge them together and really start looking at those ELD classes and ESL options and say, is that really the best option for our kids? And if it isn't, then what do we need to do a little bit better? Maybe it's training of those teachers. A lot of times we're having schools that principals are saying, well, hey, you're new to our school. Can you do this ELD class? Oh, no, I don't have any training. Well, that's okay. I just want to fill your, your um, you know, time. And maybe that's who we're getting to teach those courses. And that's probably not the approach that we need to take because as Christelle said, we've got to look at quality and how we're using those courses. And that's what we're engaging in right now. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so that gives you kind of an idea about the power of regular education teachers that can scaffold instruction to make content comprehensible. It, you know, it's everyone's responsibility uh, in the school. It's not just, oh, that's the ESL department, which I've heard, I'm not gonna say where, and they do such a good job. Okay, well, you know. But Christelle, can I also add something on that too? Is we, We've always had the setup here in Granite of having an ALS teacher, right? And so it was a good concept, a great idea, great start. But now with a majority minority district, it takes the whole school. And so we basically at some level have really given teachers the option at this point to say, well, those aren't my kids. That's the ALS teacher's job, right? And that's what I'm seeing. And now since we've implemented these teams, we have prof professional learning teams that have compliance coaches on there that are asking these questions that Christelle and the, and the uh, feds want us to ask schools. And now what we're seeing is schools are changing their thought process now because we're asking questions, we're giving them help. And I think Michelle's doing this uh, a lot and Jordan as well. Um, but we're asking those questions and now we're getting schools uh, that are that are now putting together teams. Heaven forbid, wow, we've got teams now that are talking about multilingual kids instead of one teacher who also has classes who is who was supposed to be in charge of 500 kids in the school. That's ridiculous. That concept needs to leave. And that entire school needs to be in charge and they've got to put teams together that really talk about it. And so, you know, tools like Elevation are helping us to, to get the, that out there so schools can look at it in their teams. And so you're exactly right, Christelle. We've got to look at different ways, especially in bigger districts, um, how to make sure that access is there for kids. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, when Dave and I get together, we just, we have these passionate conversations all the time. And so, you know, this is the thing we have to, we have to actually feed our energy on that. And who are we really working for? We're actually working for the children of Utah and it's all the children of Utah. And I saw uh, Michelle from Jordan and she's, they, she's done some, they've done some really interesting things about working with administrators. Um, so, and then I also saw Connie and Chris, and this goes back to this. Hi, yeah. Can, yeah, Michelle, can you, can you talk about the work that you all have been doing? Yeah, Dave, Dave and everybody has been saying some great things. It's, it's really important that the idea of, oh, this is the language and culture services department. This is the equity department's thing and then leaving it to that to deal with the brunt of the numbers and the growing amount of newcomers that we have in the district and so changing that narrative of it's our responsibility to it's everyone's responsibility has been big um and among you know like dave said you know to mining was a great concept and worked really well in granite for the time but now as we're getting growing numbers constantly we've got us we've got to prepare the schools when this enrollment happens how they can work with students and what their steps should be to make sure that the families are properly taken care of and the biggest thing when it came to compliance is there's no i mean other than title three there's nothing that will 
ding them or give them a little slap on the hand if they don't do their compliance um, in a way other than they end up being in TSI. Like that's the long-term ding on their hand kind of thing. And so what we've done is to kind of create the conversation with the administrators. We have administrative work workshops where the principals can come into our office conference room and we've allowed um we've done five through um november and now and they're just for two hours they're open house style they can sit down and look at how to look at the numbers of l's they have at this school their data and put together the compliance form that we turn into the state every year. So Michelle, you're, you're uh... um, and when the principals start to see the data, see where their students are, where they've been and put together a plan in place, it starts to really get them realizing, oh, this is how we can avoid to show up. It was like we were throwing a party and we didn't know who was going to show up. And we had a full house of administrators because we want this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so your reception is not all that clear. So if you didn't, so what, what they're doing is they're like open house workshops for uh, administrators and they come in and they actually use the annual self-assessment from Title III to educate the principals and administrators uh, on, you know, not just the regulations, but the ways in which those regulations can support how they're changing their practice. See, that's why we don't have this huge application. We have a self-assessment tool so you can monitor your own progress. So Michelle, are you back? Okay, she might not be able to. Can you hear me okay? Okay, it's it's kind of weird. It's, no. No, not, not really. So I don't know, I don't know if you're not close to a router or you're traveling or something, but we can't hear you very well. Oh, she's at a high school and she says the high schools are dead zones. Okay, so uh, Michelle, I'm going to actually go to Anya from Alpine. She has some things uh, to share with all of us. And then I'm hoping um, Chris from Murray. And then I'm thinking uh, Connie to talk about the uh, registrar training that you've been working on. So Anya. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Christelle, for, for um, putting this forum for us to discuss. I would agree with everything that has been shared already. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about some things that we're doing, um, utilizing Elevation. Um, Elevation has modules to support um, educators and tier one instruction, as well as build their capacity. So we, did, we are now in the third year of utilizing Elevation. And this year, and I will say at the end of the year, we really have focused on the instructional piece to support tier one. So as we have gone to do many of the trainings across the district, both in elementary and secondary, this is a focus that we have given. And that has allowed us to do several trainings for both content area teachers at the secondary level as well as elementary professional learning to support their tier one instruction. Um, but I think one of the things that has been probably the most um, powerful that has come out of those conversations is that both at elementary and secondary or directors have created focus groups similar to what uh, Michelle described at the administrative level, but this is at the educators level. So they or um, educators come similar to what Michelle described and learn strategies. And now our TSAs, which are teachers under special assignment specialists, can go out into the schools and actually do PLCs within those content areas at the secondary level 
and with elementary at the grade level teams. So those has been some things that have been um, successful. Um, we've had some of our um, schools, um, TSI schools, leveraging the elevation modules for professional learning, which um, this has been actually really exciting because he utilized a grant to pay his whole staff to get you know, this trainings, because as you know, they could get credit through the state. So he just um, shared this with his staff. As a matter of fact, two days ago, we're working with Elevation to even create certifications and levels. So our teachers at that particular school, which is a TSI school, they're all going to go through that professional um, learning experience of the modules. Thanks, Anya. Uh, so Anya was from Alpine. Uh, so I'm going to say this. Uh, Chris from Murray had to leave, uh, but I'm hoping Connie can talk about their training for registrars, which again is really, is really important. But one thing that I think is really valuable is that we use this opportunity to learn from each other in the way the redesign for the Title III page would be you all connecting in a way that you can see how strategic you're being in the work that you're doing for multilingual learners. And we had this uh, really great uh, conversation with Connie and their, um, ser their student services department and the work they're doing with registrars, which again, we're not, the, the goal is to provide the kind of training and insight that help people see that uh, the experiences that we're having with um, increased diversity in the schools is a valuable asset and not a detriment. And so, you know, how do we change that idea uh, into being a way that we work with registrars and counselors uh, so that they're more responsive to the needs of students and families? So, Connie, do you want to talk a little bit about the training that you, that you all have done? Yes, good morning. I wish, um, good to be here. Um, we've, we've done a lot of, uh, this year we've done a, um, a lot of a training, especially with our secondary administrators um, to really change the narrative uh, regarding who is responsible for working with our multilingual learners, that it has to be all of our teachers in the building. And I the discussions we've had with Building principles has been amazing over the past few months. Um, we've also, we work really closely with our family and student services um, uh, department. And we have, we're really working hard on um, putting together um, a pamphlet, like, you know, a, a procedures for all registrars and office managers um, for our intake process with our refugee families. Um, it's not perfect, um, but we're working on it. Um, and um, student services is a great, they're, they're wonderful, very positive. Um, they see the assets that our families are bringing um, with them. Um, so it's, we're, we're also um, trying to onboard Elevation Ed also um, in our schools um, to support uh, tier one instruction and um, support our teachers in their in their classrooms. Thanks, Connie. So what questions do you have about um, this ongoing issue about the way in which every school is a welcoming environment for every single family, no matter what language they have? And if you want to share something that you're doing that is making a difference, I think is really is really important. And then the other thing is the way in which you support changing the conversation uh, around, you know, a system that can be responsive and innovative to the needs of families. I think all of you, I think, have seen uh, kind of the uh, political uproar around uh, HB 215. Um, okay, so, the, so this is not good. I mean, uh, the way in which 
public schools have been characterized as not responding to individual needs of learners, right? And I have tons and tons of examples of where that is already happening. That's happening with individual learning plans for students and the way in which, you know, um, districts are working. And I, I was going to say that many people don't know that <clears throat> uh, part of the Title III funds is a percentage that goes to, and this is the federal definition of immigrant, which is students uh, who have not been schooled in the United States for at least three consecutive years, right? So that's kind of the federal definition. When we do the calculations t to show significant increase in who those students are, the districts that get immigrant funding are, besides Granite, which, you know, as we know, Dave has been very clear about the increase, but also Canyons and Provo and Alpine. So most people have other ideas about, you know, the way in which families come into the state. But I think this is a really important way to think differently um, about the way in which the support we provide for schools, for counselors and registrars can make a really difference in how, you know, the general population actually perceives the work that public schools do. Um, I think what we're going to do now, we're still, we're going to wait for Anne Michelle uh, to talk about the consolidated plan that was resubmitted. Uh, but I don't know if, I don't know if Carolyn from Park City wants to talk about some of the innovative things that they've done in, in Park City. Now the reason I'm suggesting this is that, <clears throat> uh, and Carolyn maybe you can, I don't know if you're there but I think it's the 10th anniversary of the Dream Big program in Salt Lake, which is a, a collaborative uh, summer program to ensure that uh, students learning English and other diverse students end up being well prepared for advanced coursework. So the question becomes, you know, how do we use whatever resources we have to ensure that post-secondary success is just something that's accepted um, by knowledgeable parents and by those in uh, districts that typically if you look at the data uh, we don't really have we don't have uh, so I have a message from well she just emailed me so uh, Megan she emailed me about when she would be available Um, so the, the issue ends up being, again, you know, how do we ensure that students learning English have access to grade level content, which then provides the opportunity for them for uh, advanced coursework. Uh, there are some really, ex uh, really great examples, um, and I don't know if Monty wants to talk about any of the East High work that they're doing with, um, <clears throat> you know, the way in which they're doing pathways for secondary success uh, at East. I know Monty, are you willing to mention anything about that? No, I don't. I don't really have all that down yet. But they're doing a lot of work with different pathways and and, and really supporting students. And it's taken the whole staff to get involved, like we kind of keep mentioning. So it's it's going. It's moving along pretty well. Yeah, so one example is that all their ninth graders um, are doing a curriculum that is uh, from, um, and I'm, I'm losing it, it's, they have a, like an AP diploma pathway, but all their ninth graders, so they're detracking their system, which means, you know, they're not putting low level classes and remedial classes in for ninth graders when they come into school. And so you have to think about, you know, how did they do that? And as Monty said, how did they get the entire staff to be on board with detracking? You know, so that's, that's the, other, the other issue. So I'm going to give you some background and hope that Anne Michelle will be on. Uh, so there's been lots of concern um, about the WIDA exit score. 
and I don't know all the details. I actually uh, worked with Aaron Bruff um, to do two things, and I think most of you, we sent out the data almost two years ago. We ran a data, and the question was, uh, how is it in every district that students have access to uh, career and college coursework if the exit score for WIDA was moved to a 4.2 or a 4.0. So we ran all these data and we ended up sending it uh, out, and this was two years ago, uh, and the results were if we maintain the 5.0 then generally what ends up happening for whatever reason uh, students learning English don't have access to any advanced coursework. Uh, if we moved it to a different composite, then more would have had access, right? So the question ends up being, there are multiple questions related to the, to the WIDA score. <clears throat> uh, and again, the assessment department are the ones who are really pretty much responsible for this and made those decisions based on the work that they did with uh, assessment people and people across the country related to the change um, in the reclassification. So when we first started this uh, in 2015 and did the first consolidated plan for ESSA when it was reauthorized, one of the things that we did uh, was, oh, I'm glad Michelle's back in her office, so we'll come to you in a minute, Michelle. Uh, what ended up happening was um, the 5.0 in 2015 had been used as a composite score for reclassification based on the work that we had done in 2015 with other states and high achieving states, right? So then, and I think it was, so that was 2015. Then in 2018, WIDA recalibrated, and I think some people here were, I know uh, Alpine was on that as well, they recalibrated it so that it would be more, the, the standards and the scoring would be more rigorous, right? So as a consequence, you know, when you look at the scores, you'll see 2015, 2016, 20, and then you'll see this huge, like 2018 gap, and then you'll see like everything being plummeted generally. So one of the issues ends up being instructional. So we're going to wait a little bit and then we're going to find out kind of the results in the timeline and everyone in the assessment trying really hard to give us some answers and I really appreciate that. Is that when we started analyzing the data we actually discovered that <clears throat> students um, who were on the cusp of becoming proficient by 5.0, right? Uh, like they were 4.8, 4.9, 4.6, all that. Their lowest scores were, and we all know this, were speaking, right? Uh, and Megan just recorrect, uh, corrected me. It's about resetting standards, so no big deal but it's, it happened in 2018. Uh, and so the speaking scores uh, give you an indication of what happens in the classroom, okay? So one is uh, struggles around teaching academic conversation, right? And then organizing the classroom environment so that meaningful conversations can actually happen in the content area. We see this pattern starting, believe it or not, with low speaking scores and high listening scores because kids are being talked at uh, in the fourth grade. So by the time, because content, if you know the standards, you know, from third to fourth, there's like this big content, heavy cognitive load gap, right? So then all of a sudden teachers feel like they have to inform, you know, inform and tell, inform and tell. <clears throat> and so by the time the kids get to sixth grade and they leave elementary school, they are never reclassified and they never have any opportunity for advanced coursework, ever. And that's a serious, like that's a serious, I mean, if you want to get serious, that's like a serious civil rights violation. I mean, one of the key indicators for civil rights obligations from, 
the Department of Justice is that all students, especially students learning English, have access to advanced coursework. Okay, that does not happen in Utah. So that's kind of, that's kind of the background. So we're going to go from that to, uh, Michelle, do you want to pick up where you left off? I think that would be, I think that would be helpful since. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me great? Oh, look at that. It's good to see everybody's names and see some familiar faces. Um, one of the big things as we were talking and, and referencing the numbers that are growing in our district, Jordan district has gone from, you know, small 1300 ML students to 4,000 in two years. And so when I came aboard in 2020, I, I was uh, in Granite. So all the things that Dave has been working on and improving, um, it's been great to hear and work along with him in the growth of it. Um, it was definitely an important fact to get everyone on board so that they could take ownership in all of the MLs. Um, it's not just the language and culture services department's issue. It's not equities issue. It's the district's issue, even when it comes down to small things like interpreting. Um, when custodial calls me or, you know, transportation calls me, I make sure that it's like, well, what are you doing as a department to fund your interpreting? And so the biggest thing that I started doing was just going out like I am now, I'm not even in my office, is just going out to schools and talking to administrators and counselors and just touching base with them, a quick check-in, how are things going, how is enrollment going, and really seeing that they had tons of questions every time I showed up, or they wanted to show me something that was really positive happening in their school. Um, and so these drop-ins, just have been really magical in forming the relationships with the administrators so that they see me and my department daily, um, which I think is important. And so from there, we said, okay, with the compliance that Christelle explained really well, that check-in and, and that, how are you doing? What is going well in your school and how many L's do you have and what's happening? they needed more ownership in that. We found out that there were teachers doing the compliance and turning it into us so we could turn it into the uh, state. I mean, principals weren't touching the compliance forms. And so we created an open house style um, for them to come to the district office, sit down using a new form um, that my team created that kind of asked the questions and you know, what is their plan in doing that? We didn't know how many people were going to show up. It was kind of inviting them to a party and hoping that we have friends come. Um, and so we we hosted about four or five of those from November to January. And, you know, as Christelle and a few other people saw, I was on a Zoom with them when one of them was happening and it was a full house. They want the information on how to... Um, do this. So if I can share my screen, I can show you just some of the com conversations that we have. We went from an old compliance form to a newer one. And as um, Anaya and I think Dave and a few other people have mentioned, um, when I heard it two years ago, I was like, oh, I don't know. And then Park City started using Elevation is truly a platform that is user friendly, straightforward, and one that schools are grabbing a hold of the data and the information that it contains. Um, and so that I think ease of that platform and the usage of it has made administrators and teachers comfortable with using the data. Um, and so I think partnership and that constant conversation has been helpful. Um, so I'll share it's, uh, we, I, hopefully there's no student names. Um, just pretend you're not seeing all of it. But so, okay, here's a blank one. So we have the program evaluation and the goals, right? And we have them screenshot, we say from the Utah School Report Card, but a lot of them as they're starting to get familiar with elevation have screenshotted um, the elevation data and placed it in here with their L's. And then we do what Dave said, where is your team? There's not an ELD lead at your school that's by themselves, who's usually the fifth grade teacher or the 10th grade English teacher. This one person is not going to fix all your ML problems at school. Who is your team supporting this ELD lead? Who is the counselor? And we've even gone so far to this year talking about, do we need to add an administrative assistant, a secretary on this team? Because those are the... Um, 
typical ladies in the front office registering our families. So we're, we're saying like the other is, should it be them? And then we have them do all the things that we're asked of on our Title III compliance to report to the state, their growth goal. Um, we put elevation on here now um, as that so they can have a step place because we've seen how the data can be transferred in easily um, and the procedures and then instructional plans and the questions, the language program and best practices. Um, so this, this stopping and thinking gets them going um, on how they're gonna structure it. Uh, the truth of the matter is our schools didn't get alerted to the fact that they needed this until 24 of them gotten TSI, right? So when we do our compliance and our check-ins, you know, principals would poo-poo it over the years because there's no slap on the hand that will get them to do it. And what gets them to do it is the shame of being in TSI, right? And they don't want that stigma on them. And so now it's like, oh my goodness, we have 24 schools. And the main reason why they're in TSI is either for special ed or their MLs, right? Um, and so it's not just the answer of, oh, we just have 10 MLs now, or we just have 30 and it's no big deal. They're now starting to work towards a language program and looking at who is endorsed in their, you know, their school um, and how many, um, and the language acquisition, the community outreach, really seeing the tie of the working together. Um, and so, we, like I said, we've just taken everything from the compliance and put it into this form to make it, make it pretty. Um, and, you know, Shasta did a really good job putting it together. The team double checked it, made sure that it aligned with the form that we got from the state. And so we just put that in there. And when we have these open houses, the teacher specialists on my team are sitting down next to the principal, guiding them through, giving them ideas, suggesting people that could help them with different things. And, and it's been um, a big impact because after this, like as we were looking at um, the goals, we have schools that are, gonna, are doing community nights, multicultural nights, um, and just the impact that's happening on the school level because of this connection, they're starting to see the importance, right, of the community outreach um, and little things. We had a job fair last night with HR, and um, they typically would have an interpreter there, but now they're starting to think of, oh, is this flyer translated in our top language of Spanish? And so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful transition to see district wide that people are starting to think differently. Um, even with our custodial uh, services, they reached out to us and said they want interpreters because they have a lot of custodial staff that speak Spanish and they have to hit certain points of, um, you know, trainings for them to get like a a job lane change for more money. And a lot of the, you know, Hispanic workers, employees aren't able to do it because they don't understand the training in Spanish. Can our team help them? Can we get a translator for that? And so now every month, uh, word's gotten out and we have more employees being supported. And I think it's changing the climate and culture district wide, um, which impacts the student learning. It's not gonna, you know, make everything perfect. We still have eternal threes that we have to get down to that instructional practice with teachers and we're still working. But I think getting at that administrative level and having those conversations has started the process. Um, and we still have a ways to go, but- um, Michelle. Yeah start. <laughs> Michelle, we created uh, t-shirts that are really bright that we make our principals wear. It's, it, it says, I'm in TSI. It's got a big smiley face on it. I'm kidding. I know this is being recorded, Christelle. Don't. It's a joke. We don't have that. <laughs> but I mean, and, and honestly, that stigma and shame of it does make people you know, awaken to the fact because you, I would get that a lot whenever I would go out to schools. Oh, we just have 30 students, like, you know, those 30, but it's like, well, your 30 students aren't making any academic growth and what are you doing? And, um, and just getting them to change their thought of when they succeed, we, the whole school succeeds. Um, we have a lot of dual language schools, right? It's like a Utah thing. Um, and so I started talking to those dual language schools saying, okay, you know, and you treat those students differently because they're learning Chinese or they're learning French or they're learning Spanish. This is what our multilinguals are doing. They're linguistically gifted too, but you have a different 
spin and biased opinion of that. So you need to change that. And what you're doing at your dual lingual, you know, dual language school needs to be school wide. You, you don't share that culture with with just one grade per grade level. That's a, when you have, you know, Portuguese night, why is everyone not invited? This is your school climate. And so just getting that mindset to be changed is good. But then this week you hit something else and somebody says something off and you're like, it's, we got a long way to go. Um, but the administrative open houses have been quite the success in connecting with principals and establishing those relationships. So I would definitely encourage you to um, do that. It's a lot of driving around. You go in, you but you learn so many different things, and you talk to the students of what they need, um, which is also then you can be that voice for them. So thanks for being patient with my Michelle, I have, issues. I had a question for you. Um, when you do your administrative focus groups, are you combining both elementary and secondary principals? You do. Yeah, it's just an open house for whoever can make it on that day. We've had the principal, we've had assistant principals come in, we've had both, um, but it's just, it's not a specific thing. Um, we did an elevation training on Friday and we, ha we had it focused on elementary because we had just been focusing on secondary. So some of our trainings are focused, but the administrative open house during the compliance season is whoever can make it. Okay. That's good to know because we just launched, a, but we're dividing it into secondary and elementary. So I was curious to hear that you know, the success of having it both combined because it is a lot of work, you know, when you're doing like secondary and then elementary. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice because on, on my team, I have um, five teacher specialists, four currently consistently here. And so uh, one of them is focused just on high school and the other one is focused just on middle school, junior high. And then the other two um, are elementary. So whoever comes in, then that teacher specialist just goes over and kind of works and talks with them. So it's like a controlled chaos room. Like we have the introduction, we show them elevation. And then when you walk in, you hear people talking in, in different pockets. Yeah, when I, when I actually saw this uh, experience uh, with the open house, it was really amazing. People were like totally engaged. And so this attitude about, you know, here's an open house, whoever comes, comes. Uh, you know, I think sets a really different culture tone to this idea of we're mandating this because that always sets people off, if you know what I mean. So, uh, Michelle, thanks so much. Okay, so now uh, Anne Michelle has joined us and Megan has been here too, so thanks, Megan. Uh, and the reason I'd like Anne Michelle to speak about this specifically is, you know, her role as the person who's generally in charge of accountability uh, and works closely with the assessment department. Uh, not to mention, she's been a longtime friend of mine when we were um, up together. I don't even know how many years ago that was, and we were sharing kind of a floor with a cubicle next to us or something. Um, she has experiences from my perspective in special education, which I think is really valuable, as well as um, you know, multilingual learners and WIDA, we've done lots of professional development work together uh, as, you know, uh, she's tall, I'm short, so it's like short and sweet. She's sweet, I'm short. Uh, and so, you know, I think the advantage is to have these different perspectives in relationship to how we've actually gotten to this point where the Utah Consolidated Plan uh, has been changed, specifically related not solely to, to accountability, but Title III is an accountability for Title I, and so we have to better understand how things are connected. So um, I'm turning it over to you, Anne Michelle. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to see so many familiar names, many familiar faces. It's been a while since I've been able to uh, meet with this group, but um, I'm a, Anne Michelle Neal. I'm the accountability specialist at USBE. I also uh, work hand in hand with Megan in the administration of WIDA access. We both serve on subcommittees for the WIDA consortium. Um, I'm here to provide you an update on the amendment to the SS state plan specifically related to the adjustment to the exit criteria and when that will come into effect. I know that that's um, a huge question on everyone's mind, especially those in this room. Um, 
we uh, went through public comment and it was our amended amendments to the to the SSD plan were approved in um, October. The plan was prepared and then submitted to the Department of Education um, by Dr. Patty Norman on September, sorry, December 13th. Uh, the US Department of Education has set a deadline this year for um, amendments submitted prior to February 1st. They commit to a 120 day response to the state. We are well ahead of that February 1st um, deadline. Um, and so well within that um, guarantee, that I guess assurance that we will receive feedback within 120 days, um, which puts us at about um, mid-April for a response. Um, an important caveat is that um, if they are were to, and we expect this to happen, and they should um, reach out to us with any questions. That time, that 120 days goes on pause until we respond. They reserve the full 120 days to provide their response. So it's an impetus on us to respond quickly and thoroughly to their inquiries. Um, we have not received anything um, as of yet, but um, I think that May is a realistic timeline, which gives us enough time to work through the accountability business rules for applying the new exit criteria for um, the data, post out the validated data you receive in June um, to make exit determinations. Um, in terms of what are the implications of this change, uh, we have a practice in place or a procedure where we do not go to prior years and reverse decisions that are, that that um, have been made. Um, so the exit criteria would, if when it is approved by the U.S. Department of Education, my best estimate is sometime during the month of May, would apply to students who take who are taking the WIDA access test now. They could be um, considered for exit um, at the end of in near the end of the school year. And um, I know TSI is an important piece of this as well. We will apply the new exit criteria to TSI identifications as well as schools who are eligible for exit. Um, that the, the um, new progress targets and the um, uh, rate of exit will be considered as part of exiting TSI. Um, as, as well as it will be for new identifications, but no decision that has been currently made for TSI or for student um, placement in EL services um, should not be reversed at this time. So um, can you give us a little background about how the decision was made mm -hmm. in relationship to 4.2 and then how the speaking uh, criteria also was how those decisions were made. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, we we looked at our the distribution of weed access scores and in our state and found that a 5.0 is two standard deviations above the mean. Um, this means that uh, only the top five percent of English learners were exiting. If say we were to apply that to ACT and say that only the top 5% of students who take the ACT can go to college, there would be a huge uproar about, about setting that kind of threshold. And so um, this was a clear indication that our current exit criteria is too high. Uh, based on that same distribution, imagine a bell curve. Uh, we found the mean score, the average uh, WIDA access score uh, for all multilingual learners in, in the state. And we set the exit criteria at one standard deviation above the mean. Um, if I know this is highly statistical, but that captures 68% um, of students in, in the state. Plus minus one standard deviation captures more, you know, the a, almost a two thirds majority of of students, so one standard deviation above the mean landed at 4.2, that was the decision. Um, we looked at the possibility of students 
exiting with a, without adequate speaking, um, speaking ability in English. And we, we saw many cases where students were at a five or even a six and a one in speaking. And to uh, uh, ensure that students were truly prepared to exit, if we were going to lower the exit criteria to something that is achievable, um, rigorous, rigorous and achievable is the phrase I like to use. We wanted to um, have an assurance that students were prepared to be in the classroom um, without um, direct English language development services. And so we added the 3.5 in speaking as an assurance that students were prepared to exit. And they would not be re-identified um, in, or there would not be a need for them to, to return to services in the future. Yeah, so uh, I just want to thank you because I think uh, this was actually the best explanation that I've heard so far. So that's why I wanted, I know you have a statistical background. So I wanted you to really uh, share with us. And so the speaking will be 3.5. Is that right? Not 3.6? 3.5. Okay, so that's a really important distinction. And uh, you all have to really communicate this to teachers. You have to figure out how you're going to provide professional learning for teachers so they're teaching academic conversation in the classroom. They can't, be, they can't be lecturing students. If I can add to that, Christelle, um, speaking, we looked at many different combinations of scores. Would it be a 4.2 with a threshold score in literacy? Would it be a 4.2 with a threshold score in writing? We looked at all different combinations and found that by far speaking was the greatest need in the state for our multilingual learners. And the decision to uh, add the requirement for speaking was to increase the focus of instruction on academic conversations, that students need to have opportunities to speak in the classroom. And um, just as adding English learner progress to our accountability system has increased focus on English learners, and um, uh, I just heard a fabulous description of how, um, you know, there are no more excuses for, well, we only have 30 kids in our school. Um, this will focus instruction on what students need, which is practice in speaking. Yeah, so I want to thank you for that because, um, <clears throat> you know, that's kind of where the juice is and the way in which classrooms are structured to focus on that. I mean, I've seen some really brilliant examples. As I said, you know, one was this amazing math class uh, in Park City in the fifth grade, another one, uh, lots of lots of really interesting math classes. Uh, in the San Juan. And I'm using these examples of content. I mean, I think that's the piece that's really valuable. Uh, part of the problem at secondary ends up being, uh, it seems to me as a high school, middle school, elementary school teacher, is uh, the English language arts people actually are stuck in a very kind of old way of thinking about uh, the way in which literature is taught when even in the standards, 70% has to be, uh, if you notice, in the standards, it's about nonfiction. And the reason it's based on that is that when students are prepared to go to college, that's what they have to read in the content, in different content areas. So the things that you're saying, uh, you know, Anne Michelle, are really important. And I'm hoping for, you know, this new revolution in transforming instruction so that when we walk into classrooms and when I ask students, what are you learning? Why are you learning it? How will you know that you'll be successful? Uh, I did that recently at a visit with Pacific Heritage. The kids were extraordinary. They knew exactly what they were learning, why they were learning it, and they actually had a success criteria on every wall, in every classroom, in every subject. So this way that you create the conditions for students to be empowered as advocates for their own learning, you know, is what's going to change and transform education so that 
the way in which people perceive public education is going to be changed too. And really that's my hope. Okay. Yes, thank you. Is there any questions I can answer before I um, take up? Uh, I see Mindy has a hand, raised hand, Veronica, and then Veronica. I, I'm, I am an academic specialist with Dave Gomez and I have a question. I heard you speak about the 4.2 speaking criteria. I know the current exit for, is it the composite score is a 4.9 currently? And you're talking about moving it to a 4.2, possibly? Let me clarify. Can you just clarify? Because I, I so, wasn't sure what you were saying. Yeah, the current exit criteria is an overall composite score of 5.0. We are moving the overall composite to a 4.2. In addition, we're using a two-prong criteria where to exit, the student needs to have a 4.2 in their composite score and at minimum a 3.5 in speaking. So it's a two-pronged exit criteria. They have to meet both in order to exit. And what was the past speaking? There was no criteria for speaking pre previously. Um, it was only a, an overall composite score of 5.0. Okay, I really appreciate the clarification. I was taking notes, but then I was like, I wasn't sure what it exactly was. So thank you. And this, this will, this is just in the works. It yes. So, so, this, so I, I understood that. Yeah, this has to be approved by the U.S. Department of Education before we can put it into, into um, our policies. And as I was explaining about the process of that um, approval, I would expect it to. Um, be sometime in May based on the 120 day timeline that they provide. Um, they, they provide feedback within. Uh, Veronica, did you have a question? Yes, my, my internet actually went down as soon as um, Mindy asked. <laughs> but okay. I think when I finally got it back, I heard you say, they um, students, if this does if this does follow through, students have to meet both criteria, the four point two and the three point five in the speaking area, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. I just didn't get to hear your explanation. My internet went down, <laughs> but but I I got I got the gist of it. I have a feeling that's exactly what she was asking. Yes. Yes. So thank you for that clarification. And right. the other th the the other thing is to make sure that you know that as soon as the assessment department and the superintendent get notification of that. It's the assessment department that will actually send out with the probably superintendent and deputy superintendent, the official notice from the Department of Ed. Okay, so that's the thing that's really important. So I see Thais and uh, Jenny Cross, they have their hand up. So we'll start with Thais. Hey, and Michelle, I'm super excited about this, but I was just curious, is there any talks of, um considering the alternate criteria being changed so that if you're an alternate student, um, there's a different criteria to exit? Yes, I am so glad you asked this question because this is something that I um, feel very excited and passionate about. Um, we are, these steps that we are taking with the ESSA amendment are laying the foundation for us to create alternate exit criteria. There this needs to occur first, but also we are um, field testing, as you might be familiar, um, the alternate um, access this February, um, February through April, I believe, is the field test, um, so that a new alternate assessment can be created. Um, that new alternate assessment will be on a one through five scale instead of the P1, P2, P3, A1, A2. Right now they're on these two different scales that are very hard to compare, but the, the new alternate access assessment will be on the one to five scale and we will be able to set criteria for those alternate students to exit. Um, we also, I also am interested in looking um, at the data for students who are dual identified for as multilingual learners and as in special ed to see if there is appropriate exit criteria for those students as well. But um, certainly uh, alternate exit criteria is in our future. Um, 
the assessment needs to be developed first, but um, it is a, a high priority in my mind. Awesome. And, and Michelle, that's, that's exciting. Um, one clarification, I know we're field testing new alternate, but when will the new alternate test actually go into effect? Will that be this fall or later? Well, the, I, I believe the purpose for the consortium-wide field test is to get enough data to have an operational field test for next, for 2024. So next January, 2024, the uh, new alternate assessment would be available. Perfect, thanks. Thanks, Anne Michelle. Jenny? Um, so mine is just a, can we do this? So in Data Gateway, we currently have the composite scores. When we pull up a student's data, if there's going to be two criteria for the exit, can we have the composite and their speaking score on that data gateway so that it's easy for everyone to find that information quickly? Yeah, I'm actually in a meeting right now on a, a streamlining data processes. And part of um, the team I'm working with, I'm working directly with um, Aaron Bruff and Data and Statistics, um, Cliff Fellin, who is um, over our Utrex. And, and the data gateway and redesigning those reports to be more um, more useful, to have more utility and better information is um, part of the work that we will be doing. Um, aligning those to the ESSA criteria. And, and I love your, your point that um, it needs to be very clear that the overall composite, but also tracking speaking needs to be a part of that, that new design. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question. This is from Melinda uh, Lamont. She says, uh, what about the alternate screener? Will that be available in the fall? I don't think, I, I have not, I don't have any indication to say that an alternate screener will be ready in the fall. Typically a screener is, is made up of items from the, that are retired from the operational WIDA access test. Um, with such a broad field test, um, we are not the only state doing an alternate field test. Um, all states are, are being asked to participate in, in this alternate field test. They may have enough items to create a screener, but I have not heard any um, definitive promise that an alternate screener will, will be available for the fall. Um, we, I'm certainly happy to um, keep you informed as I work with the psychometrics committee for WIDA on the development of, of that. Um, but I have not yet, I've yet to hear any indication or promise that WIDA will have an alternate screener ready in the fall. The discussions we do have about alternate screener are that um, schools, an IEP has to be in place to indicate that a student needs an alternate screener. A school cannot assume the student has a disability um, and administer alternate. Um, the student does need to have an IEP in place. There will be, we've worked through some very clear flow charts for how that would work. For the time being, I would direct you, direct you to um, the Altella resources. Um, I usually just Google search Altella, that's A-L-T-E-L-L-A. -L -L it is the, um, the federal grant that is working with WIDA to develop the new alternate assessment and alternate screener. They have several um, uh, papers and resources, and, and I think that's the best place to get information at this point in time. Yeah, I actually just put uh, Altella into the chat, and it is a great resource, and they're really interesting, wonderful people who are working you know, on that uh, system. So any other questions for Anne Michelle? It's so nice to see Anne Michelle. I mean, she's one of my best friends and- It's really so, nice to be here. Thank yeah. you. Well, you're welcome. And we'll have you back uh, at different times when we can share promising practices, uh, which people have already done and it'll be in the recording for everybody. So uh, I'll say, I know you have to jump off and go to another meeting and I just have one last thing. Um, to introduce another really good friend of mine, uh, Heather Newell. Uh, and she, I met her when she was the principal at Backman. So 
there she is. Uh, so she's not feeling all that great today, but <laughs> do, you, do you want to say uh, anything about your ro role at USBE? And we're not sure. gonna, we're not going to put you under the microscope. We're just, <laughs> we're just welcoming you as, you know, uh, a longtime friend and a great colleague. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Heather Newell. I work in the Center for Continuous School Improvement, and I work with CSI schools primarily, um, and the ones that are identified for low performance or academic growth, as we're calling it. Um, so this is an identification year. It's the lowest 5% of all Title I schools. And um, we also work closely with TSI, which has a lot of identification for our multilanguage learners. Um, so, and all, all, it's all connected. So it's really nice to be at these meetings. And a part of our job as a center is to have these feelers out into all of these different departments so that we know what's going on and we can have a more unified support for schools. And so it doesn't feel so um, fragmented and, and different people are coming in for all these different things. So we're really excited. The center is, is fairly new. Um, I've been there since April and um, we're just excited to, to bring things together and to work with schools and see CSI and TSI and uh, Elevate and Springboard as assets and supports and really helping schools figure out how to continue to do what's best for kids. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Christelle. You're welcome, Heather. Uh, so I'm gonna end up mm -hmm. usually like I always do with a positive, uh, incredible experience that I had visiting a school. Um, and I already said this, I think, because of the uh, the kids that I interviewed in, in on the Navajo reservation. So this one uh, is a really interesting one, uh, which is kind of amusing. And I might have said this to you before. So uh, one is from a, a fifth grader that was recommended to me by another fifth grader because she was incredibly honest. So when I when I interviewed her, I said, so what are you learning today? And so she told me. And then I said, why are you learning it? And, you know, she wasn't sure. And how will you know, you know, that you've actually learned it? And this always stumps kids, you know, they have a challenge. And so then I said, do you have anything else that you'd like to say? And she said, yes. She says, stop spending money on those computer programs that don't work. <laughs> so that was one, <laughs> that was one thing. And then another, another student, um, uh, was very sweet and he was in a, was in a charter school and I said, so what are you, what are you learning today? And he said, well, we're not learning anything. We're just doing worksheets. <laughs> so I'm saying this as a point of humor, but also a point of lesson for all of us, right? About uh, the work of teacher clarity, the work of interviewing students. The best information on your uh, actual system is to do what you know, Michelle is doing and a lot of other people are doing. Being in the schools, having conversation with students, you know, developing relationships with colleagues. You know, um, my image, you know, when I'm on my deathbed is to think of myself as a bridge. Now, I don't mean literally as a bridge, but I'm thinking about the way in which connections can be made uh, across really kind of disparate and unusual alliances. And so it's my privilege for as long as I can to work with all of you. And I just respect and love the work that you do. So, and I'm going to stay on for a little bit if anybody wants to hang back and chat or you can email me and I'll come and visit you. So thank you so much and I'll stop the recording. <laughs>